Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, I appreciate those that came today. There was a pretty good-sized crowd, really, for this day. And I don't know how many churches didn't have services today. Uh, I don't know. I probably very few have any tonight. I don't know, but I'm glad you're here tonight. In Mark chapter 13, we're just going to look at about five verses. Look at verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour... That speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brothers shall betray the brother to death, and the father of the son and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. If you're going to look at this passage under the heading dealing with persecution, now in general this is how you deal with persecution. As I've read I could bring it in, I should do that one of these days, and bring that book, The Martyr's Mirror, in and read the actual account of the 13-year-old that was arrested because he was found reading a Bible in the middle of the day that was chained to the pulpit. He was arrested for reading the Bible. And isn't it sad, the excuses that God's people give for not reading their Bibles every day? Well, I'm too busy. Here's a 13-year-old that was arrested for that, and because their doctrine is such that they have to record everything because your salvation is contingent upon their approval, apparently. They recorded all the words that were spoken, and it's really sad. And yet, it's remarkable, too, this 13-year-old kid had absolutely profound theological answers for the questions I had way beyond his years, and I have to attribute to this. I'm sure he was somewhat familiar with the Bible, had to be familiar with it, but I suspect that God intervened and gave the right testimony, the right witness back to them, and I just have to assume that. Now, we see three principles in this passage. First of all, in verses 5 and 6, don't be deceived by false Christ. We saw that last week. Secondly, verses 7 and 8, don't interpret wars and rumors of wars as signs of the end, because there's going to be wars all the way through. And number three we'll look at tonight, it says, now expect great personal testing. And what is that for? It is in the last part of verse 9, uh, for a testimony against them. This is a general principle, but it is especially applicable to the 144,000 in the tribulation, which is what we'll look at tonight. And... Um, uh, and you can see that, especially in verse 13. Uh, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, you can say that's the ones that really are saved, the ones that are endure. That's exactly not what it says. It's exactly not what it says. The ones that endure shall be saved, shall being future. Now, um, dealing with persecution. Let's look at some things tonight. Let's pray. Lord, would you bless our time together? I thank you for these faithful that have come tonight. Lord, I thank you for what uh, we celebrate. We observe this time of year, the birth of Jesus Christ. But Lord, I thank you that we can be here and sing songs of, about him. We can fellowship together and we can honor him with the presence uh, of the church that he loved. Would you bless us tonight? Open our hearts and minds to your word. And Lord, give me the words to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to deal, first of all, with dispensations here. Now, look at the very words here. I circled some of them. Verse 9, take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And notice, and in synagogues ye shall be beaten. Now, if you're looking at dispensations, have you ever been fearful of a synagogue? Is there a synagogue in town? I think there is a gathering place. We had a Jewish guy uh, work, do some work for us one time, many, many years, 30 years ago. I think there's a gathering place, but how many of you have ever been fearful of being in that synagogue and being beaten there? No, we haven't been. Synagogues, this really is geographically <coughs> speaking about Israel, isn't it? We don't need to fear synagogues. Uh, you can see the Jewish context because next week, well, the week after next, verse 14, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, well, that is spoken of by Daniel, and that is the desecration of the temple in the midpoint of the tribulation. So that gives you a time when this is, this is leading up to the midpoint of the tribulation, which the last three and a half years are called the great tribulation, but this is the time of Jacob's trouble, isn't it? We don't have to fear synagogues today. Now, in Matthew 24, look at this perspective. And again, Matthew, 
is especially written to Jews because it is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Now, I'm not preaching a gospel of the kingdom. I'm preaching the gospel of the grace of God. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. We're called upon to be a testimony to people and share the gospel with them. In fact, the Bible speaks of a preacher in Romans. How shall they hear if they, have a, if they don't have a preacher? And how, how can preachers aren't sent? What do we preach? We preach the gospel of the, uh, salvation through the grace, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of the kingdom being preached. Now, Think about this. Think about the gospel of the kingdom. You can see our world just uh, working together to try to bring about a one world government. I think that's why America is so much targeted. As long as there's a bastion of freedom for people to flee to, then they can't impose their uh, will upon everyone in the world. As long as there's any sense of uh, freedom of speech, and there still is, although it's not what it used to be, it's hard for them to impose their will on the entire world as long as there is an economic power like the United States. Uh, they have a harder time imposing their will on the world. And the gospel of the kingdom is, listen, this is... Uh, the gospel of the kingdom, this world wants to put together a kingdom without God. Have you ever wondered how they can be so consistent with de trying to destroy every doctrine of the Bible? Imagine destroying the home. How's that working for people? They never give you the testimonies of the people that had confusion as to gender when they were young, had operations to fix that, and they get older and they tell you what a miserable mistake that was. They don't speak on those things, do they? They don't speak on those things. Why? Because it doesn't fit into their narrative. It's not the same thing. We're in Mark chapter 13. We're in Mark chapter 13. It doesn't fit in. But when the, Jesus blows that trumpet and calls us home, with us will go the indwelling spirit, not the spirit of God. He'll still be here. It'll go back to the days like uh, before uh, Acts chapter 2 where the spirit of God would come upon people, and that's plainly spoken of in the book of John. The Spirit is with you and shall be in you. And what will happen then? You know what gives you discernment about truth and error? The Holy Spirit, because it says He'll lead you into all truth. He'll lead you into all truth. What directs your step? The Spirit of God indwelling you. And when a mass of Christians are gone, what's going to prevent them from having a complete power in setting up an earthly kingdom, which is what's going to happen? There will be people preaching, and then you look at the book of Revelation, you see 144,000. I saw a JW interpretation of that, uh, because you have to ask them, what tribe are you from? Well, that is speaking allegorically. No, it's not. It's 12,000 from each of 12 tribes. How in the world can that be more plain and more clear and simple? But they'll be preaching the gospel of the kingdom because they will have figured out some things. They rejected their Savior. And they'll be preaching to all nations. They'll be preaching to all nations. I'm just so glad you're here. You don't have to, uh, just because Charlie took too long of a nap, it doesn't. <laughs> I know it is. I know it is. But 12,000 from each of 12 tribes will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Hey, you're falling for the Antichrist kingdom. This is the kingdom that Jesus is going to set up. And they'll be preaching the gospel of the kingdom to nations, not just to people. To nations. And won't that be a wonderful message? Hey, there's going to be a time of peace on earth and real goodwill toward men. It'll be a rule with a rod of iron and people won't get away with stuff. You know what I pray for all the time? I pray that the evil of people uh, and what they do, costing millions of people their, their lives, will be exposed. They'll be exposed and an end put to it. Imagine having the evil in your heart to callously and indifferently uh, set about in motion the death of thousands of children and women and old folks. I guess I'm getting to be an old folk. But... Um, you think about that. There is an, a pernicious evil in this world. And these 12,000 from 12 tribes will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. 
Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up a king. He's going to set up that kingdom. And that's the context of our passage. Antichrist is building his, but God has his own. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel, cha- I think it's chapter 2. Um, and you'll see this. Again, we preached through Daniel recently. At least it seems recent to me. But Daniel chapter 2, look at verse um, 44. And the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And you know, these false Christs are going to be saying, this is the kingdom of God. This is what God wants to set up. No, in the days of all those kings, those four different kingdoms, the God of heaven is going to establish a kingdom. The God of heaven will establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Man is happy with the uh, inspiration, if you will, of the devil to try to take the place of that verse and set up a kingdom, but uh, because it's set up by men and devils probably indwelling them, it'll be a wicked, evil place. I mentioned this morning reading about Stalin's purges. I think I think the number that comes to my mind is over 100 million people died under him, and, and uh, whether that's the right number or not, it was way more than Hitler killed. Can you imagine having the blood of 100 million people on your hands? Can you imagine having that? Some of them starved to death. Can you imagine his parents? And by the way, that wasn't the tribulation. Can you imagine his parents hearing your children cry when they go to bed that they're hungry? Now, my little grandson, William, I am certain he has two hollow hind legs because he is hungry. We literally get up from the table and in 20 minutes he's hungry again. Can you imagine? Can you imagine parents uh, all over a city because there's no food on the shelves? They are having to put children to bed hungry and they'll wake up hungry and they're cries and there's not a thing they can do about it. That's how evil men are. And those are the ones that want to set up a kingdom when Stalin was purging. He was, his was such, probably he, he uh, arranged this uh, killing in the, one of the buildings in Moscow and he used that, kind of happened in Germany as well, he used that to clamp down on the people and he got people doing just like this passage says, they're turning in their neighbors. And if you think about it, if someone... If someone could gain by turning you in, don't you know they do it today? You say, well, that's a cynical attitude toward people. That's probably a sane attitude toward people. And no, not everyone would, but lots of them would. And as I said this morning, on file and records, they've opened up, there are all kinds of blood-spattered confessions that led to the man's death. That's sad, isn't it? And as long as people trying to set aside our Constitution, it says you cannot be uh, compelled to testify against yourself. Do you know how that uh, that, uh, uh, contrasts with the rest of this world? You can't be compelled to testify against yourself. The government has to come up with the witnesses to prove that you're guilty, not that you have to prove that you're innocent. And that's amazing, isn't it? Well, 144,000 in Revelation 14, 1 through 6, they're going to be preaching to all nations. You understand that there's no prophetic event that has to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back for his bride. He could come tonight. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And if you thought about that, how different would the world be? I, I, I want to make sure that I'm where I belong when Jesus comes back. And I don't mean that I'm earning something or anything like that. I want to love the things that he loves. Don't you? When you love someone, you love the things that they love. And there's no prophetic event that prevents his return tonight. He could come tonight. He could come up, come in the morning, keep looking up. Because that's our hope. Isn't that what the Bible says? Our hope or joy It is the blessed hope, which is the return of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, But in verse 13, it says, he that endures to the end. Remember, this is under the heading of dispensationalism. Uh, Think of the world without insight and the restraint of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Now, you look at people that invent religions today, they're probably invariably lost people. 
whoever it was that invented Jehovah's Witnesses, whoever it was that invented Mormonism, you ought to hear them explain away uh, Joseph Smith's character. He was arrested for being a fraud, and then he says, oh, I saw these golden plates. And you know how he interpreted those plates? He stuck his face in a hat behind a curtain, and God gave him the word, word for word, what the interpretation was, because no one's ever heard of ancient Egyptian. No one's ever seen ancient Egyptian. No one's ever seen the gold plates. So you have to trust this guy that was arrested for being a charlatan, and he says that. Now, for that same reason, I've got a photomechanical reprint of the first copy of the Book of Mormon. And if God gave you every word, and you spoke the word it was written out there, there shouldn't be a grammatical problem. There shouldn't be uh, 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 any English problem. There shouldn't be any problem like that. And the differences are dramatic. They're dramatic because they're liars. What happens when God takes his bride home? What happens then? You know what most people want? I think most people, for the most part, want to be left alone. That's why we are entitled to one of the uh, rights that God gives us is the right to uh, self-determination or uh, to, uh, I lost the words, uh, the right to um, pursuit of happiness. What makes some happy isn't what makes other people happy. But you know, we have the right to pursue happiness. Some people love things that mean nothing to me. I love things that mean nothing to you. But you know what? It's a blessing that in our country we're guaranteed that right for the pursuit of happiness, not to afflict someone else, not to steal, but to pursue what, what makes us happy. Um, think of a world without the insight and the restraint of the indwelling Spirit of God. Uh, hearing the gospel of the kingdom, they still want their own. Just like they rejected Jesus Christ in the days of Jesus, now the world rejects Jesus Christ and his kingdom for a kingdom of their own making. Now, think about the mess that has been made of our country, and I don't mean just in two years, but it sure has gone faster in two years than I ever expected. What is the, uh, two years ago I wrote down the exact numbers, I should have pulled that out. The inflation rate, which was like 1%, now it's eight, and they think that's doing much better. I saw that the prime rent, uh, lending rate is like down to seven or eight percent. Man, that's terrific. No, it wasn't. It was two or three percent before, just two years ago. And I remember, I, I think I mentioned this, that one of Obama's uh, border czars, there's not a czar listed in the Constitution, but if you make him a czar, he doesn't have to go through the vetting process. I'm sure that's coincidental. But uh, the border czar said if there are um, a thousand people a day, I think it was, crossing the border illegally, that is a crisis. Now there's four or five thousand a day. But it's not a crisis. They'll tell you that. It's not a crisis. How could you make a bigger mess of things? How could you? And, and we live in a fairly well-insulated area. My brother tells me about Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, he goes up to this business that his boss owns, and he gets to uh, clean the human excrement off the sidewalks. He gets to take the cardboard that they burned in the middle of the sidewalk as homeless people to stay warm at night, and then now they're throwing hammers through windows, and one woman went to work, and she walked in the door, and there was a guy trying to steal the cash register because they've so emasculated the police that there's no reason to call them. If they don't see the crime, they can't even chase them down. Remember what I read this morning? I don't think I have it in front of me right now, where they want to create the greatest amount of uh, unrest and unhappiness so you'll accept any kind of, of uh, remedy. Any kind of remedy. And that's where we are today. That's where we are. I think I saw, and I've asked some of the congressmen, that in this omnibus bill, Omnibus means a whole bunch of different ways that there were 12 different um, modifications to the Second Amendment. Now, I don't know if that's the right number. I have no reason to suspect otherwise. Listen, a government that fears its people is a government that should be feared. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? 
say, well, what does the Second Amendment have to do with this country? I'll tell you, there are two amendments that are especially important today. The right to assemble freely like we are enjoying right now and the right to keep and bear arms. And our Constitution, our country was formed uh, after uh, firsthand enduring the affliction of another nation. And so they wanted to guarantee us the freedoms there. Why are they so much under fire today? Because the Bible is all about who gets to rule. The Bible is all about that. Satan wanted to wrest that rule. And <clears throat> rule was given to Jews, and then they surrendered that, and the Gentiles took it. This is the time of the Gentiles. And Gentiles are messing it all up too. And eventually Satan will set up his own kingdom, wouldn't he? Well, hearing of the gospel of the kingdom, they want their own. There seems to be a war on Christianity, doesn't there? Why in the world would morals? You know, it used to be the used to be that what was done in the darkness of people's privacy in their homes wasn't brought out in the public, even the things that weren't immoral. Now not only is perversion brought out into the public, I've had uh, street preachers tell me how much was just blatantly done in front of them in broad daylight as they preached nothing more than the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is it being so attacked today? Because I think we're that toilet swirling the last little bit before everything goes down, down the drain. And the war on Christianity is out in the open. Morals are attacked. The home is attacked. Um, the Bible is attacked. I, I don't know why I get some of these posts that talk about that uh, some guy that looks like he's a professor, and that professor tells you that obviously this part of the Bible is not legitimate. That's someone that that's someone that is so evil, so devious, and yet that is the and and Charlie had the right answer. You you see that all the time. You see that all the time, and they're they're uh, uh, slandering the name of my Savior. They're slandering the names of the apostles. They're slandering. A, uh, certainly, they use God's name in vain all the time. Why? There's a war on Christianity. That should tell you what's important today. That should tell you that it's up to us to preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. So deal, first of all, with dispensation. Secondly, how about dealing with our own hearts? We see the worldwide Antichrist kingdom. It's coming into focus, isn't it? You can see it. When leaders, I mean, think of Jimmy Carter who claims to be a Baptist. I guess he goes to some graveyard dead Baptist church, okay, and teaches Sunday school there. I'm pretty sure I know what's taught, okay? He says he's all in favor of a one world government. I think it's time for that. We saw this morning the numbers. I don't have them in front of me now. Has the United Nations that was supposed to negotiate peace and bring about peace on earth, goodwill toward men, has it done anything? No, in the last 246 years, there have been 17 years free of war. They have not done it, have they? Why? Because men at best are still men. The best of men are men at best. And there's a, we can see the man after God's own heart is guilty of adultery and murder, can't we? We see the lawgiver takes the law in his own hands and kills an Egyptian. You understand, the best of men are men at best, and I think those are two of the finest men in the Old Testament. And you know what the devil likes to do? He likes to take men that are doing something for them and try to compromise them. Man, don't, I mean, we need to take our testimony seriously, don't we? It's that important. Well, dealing with your own hearts. We see that Antichrist kingdom in view. The threat of the gospel of the kingdom is in view too. Stalin's purges, he controlled the media. Now, this doesn't sound current, does it? 
He controlled the media. He, <clears throat> um, he invented charges against people. Invented them. They had mock public trials with directed verdicts and then immediate execution. That's what Stalin did. If you went back in history, it's happened over and over. I'm sure that's what Hitler did over and over again. In China, you're arrested for believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is, is uh, the Son of God. You mean you don't even have the right to your own beliefs? That's in our world today. That's in our world today. Stalin did all this to consolidate power, and I'm just bringing up Stalin because I read about him yesterday. People ratted out their neighbors, hoping to stave off attention to themselves that was negative. Oh, people wouldn't do that today, would they? Of course they would. Of course they would. I remember 30 years ago, because in the state of Oregon, your license plate is a small fee, and it lasts for two years. And I believe, I don't, I think, there was no sales tax. So people would register their motorhome in Oregon, put a two-year plate on it, and then drive it home to Washington. So people were given uh, financial um, consideration for turning in their neighbors. Yeah. If that motorhome's parked in front of the house too long and a neighbor turns you in, you're trying to evade two, three, four thousand dollars in sales taxes and whatever the uh, tax was on, they were turning them in for that just for money. What about when your life's on the line? And by the way, I know that because it was, it was well known when I lived in Washington. Of course they'd turn people in. People ratted out their neighbors to look good. Now this sounds terrible. It says, <clears throat> it says, uh, the brother, in verse 12, shall betray the brother to death. Why? Because even though blood's thicker than water, if your life might potentially be on the line, people will do some pretty dumb and crooked things, won't they? This is a time when I don't believe I'll be here. I'll be in heaven with Jesus. Well, the threat of the gospel of the kingdom is in view. Um, people will do anything to spare their own lives, won't they? And what's, as we look at our own hearts, what's personal responsibility? Never forget this. They'll preach the gospel of the kingdom, but salvation's a personal thing, isn't it? Salvation is a personal thing. When you endure to the end, you know what that means? They've believed God's word, and they know they're not to take the mark. They've believed God's word, and they know when God says flee to the mountains, they flee to the mountains. They believe God's word. When you believe God's word, it makes a difference. Like I said, I'm not worried about synagogues. There aren't very many in our country. There's some, yes, but not too many local, are they? This is a talking about that day. And the world is focusing their eyes upon Israel, aren't they? Personal responsibility. Salvation distinguishes you, doesn't it? I don't mean that you're better than other people. No. But you'll be talking with people and there's just some, their spirit bears witness with your spirit and you just suspect that they're saved. You've experienced that, haven't you? I have. You just suspect they're saved. Why? The same Holy Spirit is in them as in us. And no, it's not a scientific thing, but sometimes there's just that witness, isn't there? Salvation makes a difference. And these that are in that day persevere to the end. They believe the words of God. You know, <clears throat> with all the talk of the rapture and all the talk of Jesus coming for his own and all that talk, there are going to be some people that remember and wish they'd trusted. And I suspect those people will open their Bibles and figure some things out they didn't want to figure out before. And if it says, head for the hills, they're going to head for the hills. What would I do if I were in this place? I'd head for the hills with my family. Wouldn't you? And he that perseveres to the end. Now, there's going to be two ways to persevere to the end. One is you're executed for your faith. The other one is that you somehow or other escape execution, but you maintain your faith. Enduring to the end. 
I don't have to endure to the end. I don't have to. Salvation's personal. Salvation makes you different. And yet here perseverance is spoken of. The Jews rejected Jesus and his testimony. Now, the witnesses, 144,000, are testimony against the rulers of this world. And they don't like that. Have you ever wondered about that? The Bible says there are three kinds of people today. Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. Isn't that right? Why would 144,000 witnesses be from 12 tribes of Israel? See, if you're, a, if you're in the church, you're either the church of God or your national heritage. If you're lost, you're your national heritage, but not the church. Why are these preachers Jews? Why are they Jews? Because they're preaching to the world, and that's what God has ordained them to do. The witnesses are a testimony against the rulers of this world. The Bible says they're hated of all men for his name's sake. They're hated of all men. There are people in this world that know you're a Christian. They don't hate you. They may not believe the gospel you preach, but they don't hate you. You've shown them that you care for them. You've shown them that you're honest and upright. They don't hate you. But man, when the world is working toward a one world government and you're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they're going to be hated. And to this day, uh, I think it was Al Gore that said that the uh, Biggest obstacle to uh, peace in this world is what? Christians. Bible-believing Christians. Why? Because we don't follow along with their stuff. I got a text from James. Well, I texted James the other day, and I said, here it is this morning. It's a beautiful, bright, sunny day with a clear blue sky. It's 35 below zero, and we lost our power. He said, no thanks. He said, this weekend in Florida, it's supposed to be 20 degrees. And I said, wow, that's cold. He said, that's the coldest it's been since the 1970s. So global warming. Anyway, uh, it's the coldest it's been since the 1970s. And I said, what does it do to agriculture? He says, I don't know if he's just talking about his area, but he said the, the citrus uh, orchards have been taken out and they've made... Uh, 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 subdivisions out of them. Subdivisions. Well, the gospel of the kingdom, and that is all about who gets to rule. Notice the devil. He indulges your flesh. The Bible says he's a liar. He's a murderer. He kills. Aren't you glad he had nothing in Jesus? He did everything he could. Tempt tempting him. Give him an easy way and all those things, but he had nothing in Jesus. Who rules? And yet there's 144,000. You know what they're preaching? The answer is not in man. Listen, this world is not going to be at peace because smart men got together and pooled their resources. Or rich men got together and pooled their resources. I find it very interesting and frankly offensive that rich people today think that because they're good at computers or software, that they're good at medicine. Why rich people seem to think that they can manipulate elections so that, and put money, in. it's funny how this guy that was the big, what's his name, Brinkman, Sam Brinkman or something like that, billions of dollars in fraud, billions of dollars, he supported Democratic candidates all across the country and folks have asked him, well, are you going to give the money back or give it to a charity and they're not getting an answer out of them? Why? Why? Because they think the answer is in man. The answer is not in man. The answer is not in man. The answer is in the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Isn't it? I'm so glad I'm saved. That's a decision you never regret, isn't it? Verse 5, it says, Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. You know why the answer is not in men? Because men deceive you. Men deceive you. When you look at personality disorders, one of them is, is a, a psychopath or a sociopath or similar. 
You know, they make really good salesmen. Why? They deceive you. When I worked at a car dealership, we had a guy come down that was laughing. I used to put on this awful suit and face mask and everything else. In those days, they were selling undercoating. You gob tar on the bottom of your car and it's better. And this guy, this salesman came down and he said, yeah, I sold, I sold this woman undercoat job. And, she, and he said, and for 75 bucks more, I'll even overcoat it. Yes, yeah, sign me up. Salesmen can be liars. And you know why personality disorders enable some to do that? Because they know how to charm you. Why does the Bible say men will deceive you? Because men will deceive you. Men will deceive you. And by the way, in politics, that's both sides of the aisle. Men deceive you. Only God's fit to rule, isn't he? And when Jesus himself, the incarnate Son of God, came to this life, he was rejected. Rejected. Now, last of all, notice this, dealing with betrayal. Notice here it says, verse 11, uh, But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. I think that's in general truth, not just in that day. I think God puts the right words in hearts, and I, I think that God gives you a peace that is beyond your physical ability. I've experienced that a few times. Where God gives you a peace that you wouldn't otherwise be at peace when you're in a, in a, a tight place of trial or tribulation, uh, God will give you that. But here, when you're led to trial, that because, that's because you are not driven to trial, you're led to trial. These men that preach the gospel of the kingdom are no threat to this world, but to the world system, yes. And you know why they're led to trial? Because it's a testimony of these people. Remember, when Jesus was crucified, the centurion Bible says also, all the rest around said, surely this was the Son of God. You can give a really good testimony in that day, can't you? How is that one world government working for you? Well, obviously, it's not bringing peace on earth, is it? And I know this, that the communists always felt we were a threat to them because until communism spread over the whole world, it couldn't work the way it's supposed to. Are you out of your mind? And I suspect that there were some, there were some that said, well, until um, uh, democracy, which I'm not in favor of, democracy spreads over the whole world and replaces cop. We can't have peace. on I've got news for you. Neither one's the answer. What is the millennium going to be? Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. That means you won't get away with anything, but it is God who rules, not man. I have confidence that God will rule. They'll be led to trials. And the Holy Spirit promises to give you the words to be a witness to them. Can you see the peace of God filling them? It's much different than having, having confessions beat out of you. It's being a testimony to this world. And I've read testimonies of little Christian girls uh, um, when church was illegal in Russia, and they were paid to inform on illegal churches and... and uh, and um, then there was a bunch of goons that would go in and disrupt the church and beat people up and all that, where girls would be beat up, and they'd be at the next church that was raided. How could they do that? Something's different on the inside, isn't it? You don't go because you want to get beat. You don't want to, you don't want to get beat. And you can see the testimony of the saints that are dying for Jesus Christ today, and probably it's a whole lot different than America. Nor and I were talking today, and I'm convinced that most of the big churches today, they want to have a program for you because you have this need, and they want a program for you because you have this need, and a program for you because they have this need and all that. And we want to meet the needs of people, but why is it? that the Bible's not meeting needs of people. I, I'm not against helping people with specific needs, but you know what's missing there? 
How are you going to contribute to meeting the needs of other people? It's all about me. I want, I want this sweet thing said to me so I can think about it this week and it'll help me. Yeah, but how are you ministering? How do you minister? When I think of that Christmas program that was put on at Abigail's church, uh, I didn't get the final number. Did you, dear? Typically, four or 500 people get saved. As they put it on, they put it on, I think, 12 times over about 10 days. Some days, three times they would do that. They had camels walking up on this platform, and it's really a big thing. And Anna said, wherever she goes in the Midwest, people know, oh, I know that church. That's where they have that Christmas play, isn't it? Because you know what behind the scenes goes on? Man, there's building sets and, and uh, painting sets and uh, coming up with the script and training people and all that. In other words, a whole bunch of people sacrifice a whole bunch to put a ministry on that meets the spiritual needs of people in the, valley, in the area and around. Most people think nothing of serving God and sacrificing their time. That's why 20% of the people do 80% of the work, unfortunately. But the Holy Spirit of God gives words that they might be a witness to them. How did the Pharisees fare against Jesus? Not so hot, did they? But God will give His saints in that day the words to speak to counter the evil of these people. In verse 12, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son. That's almost unthinkable, isn't it? A father betraying a son to death. A brother betraying a brother. My brother's birthday was yesterday. I called him. Imagine betraying your brother to death. You know what you would do that for? Because you figure it's going to gain you something. Probably you would think that you could maybe live a little longer if you just turned someone else in. A father of the son and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. What in the world is going on there? Well, he didn't want the Holy Spirit of God dealing with you. He didn't want to hear the preachers of the gospel. When someone preaches the gospel of the kingdom, you want to put them to death or hound them. And so what they're doing is probably they've just turned into animals and they are dog eat dog. Isn't that sad? I don't want to be here then. I don't want to be here then. By the way, those situations have happened in the past before. But the gospel of the kingdom was not being preached then either, was it? A betrayal to death. We have the great reset. The great reset. They want to reset the economics of this world. Now, it's rich people that want to do that. They want to take the money from rich Americans and give it to poor people. Now, the rich people don't give their money to that. Why is that? Because the rich people want to continue to, to rule things. They think that their money entitles them. Uh, they're smarter than everyone else. The World Economic Forum, that is just evil. Both of them are evil. The World Economic Forum, you know what's going on here? People think money, a little money thrown at poor people is going to make the world a safer place. That's what they've been doing since the 60s. And our crime is so much worse today than it was then. Why? Because the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Doesn't give that promise about those that have a handout to the government. And by the way, a handout to the government means that the government is a source of your faith, not God. It's just cleverly taking your eyes off, your faith off God and put it on man. <clears throat> And <clears throat> there are whole messages on the World Economic Forum. They fear exposure. They fear exposure. What system needs to silence the opposition who oppose them by words? Now, with some of the tweets and things coming out of Twitter, it's just almost amusing. They're doing everything they can to squelch that. I've never tweeted anyone I don't even know what it is, okay? But I know if evil people hate Musk taking that over, I kind of like Musk. 
That's not a blanket endorsement, but if evil people hate someone enough, well, there's something there, isn't there? They don't like exposure. Isn't it funny that Epstein, his lists have never come out publicly. Now, people have died, just coincidentally. Why is that? Man, the evil in our world uh, is not just in other countries, because the evil is man. And when Paul says in Romans 7, in my flesh dwells no good thing, you better understand that you read your Bible, you spend your time in prayer and fellowship with God Himself each day to gain the strength and the insight, the wisdom and the courage to do what's right. Dr. Bob Sr. used to say, do right till the stars fall. Hey, that's a pretty good statement, isn't it? Just do right. Do right. Well, betrayal to death, you'll be hated of all. And yet this promise is, but he, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endurance there is to gain entrance to the millennium. The gospel of the kingdom that you've been preaching means a kingdom that is ruled by Jesus Christ sitting on an earthly throne. Man, that sounds appealing, doesn't it? Can you imagine the scrambling of the evil people of our day trying to bribe? It won't work. Trying to eliminate the voices against them? It won't work. Enduring to the end, they'll be saved says it in Matthew 24 as well. Again, I don't have to endure to the end. I'm saved. I have eternal life. I have it right now. Enduring, enduring is for another day, isn't it? It's for another day. Well, there's some doctrinal stuff in that passage. There's some great promises there. And I sure thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray.